Okay, well, hi everyone. I'm uh, Rana Jawad. I'm a Professor of Global Social Policy at the University of Birmingham and convener of the MENA Social Policy Network. And on behalf of my colleagues and our team, Olivia, who you can see, Islam, who you can't see, um, we're very happy to welcome you all um, to this um, monthly installment of our webinar. We're very thrilled. Uh, this is a really special webinar. We're collaborating with an esteemed colleague, uh, Professor Nando Sigona, who's the director of the Center for Migration in the School of Social Policy at the University of Birmingham. And we're very pleased um, to co-host this webinar together um, for our distinguished speakers from the ILO um, in, in Lebanon, who are very happy to share with us uh, a very um, milestone on a report on social protection and migrant workers in the GCC states. So we have a great pleasure for the next hour, hopefully, in hearing them present their work and discussing their research across the fields of social protection and migration that bring all of us together. Um, uh, some of you may already know uh, these webinars uh, last for an hour. Uh, our speakers uh, speak for half an hour. Um, and then we leave time for Q&A. So please post your questions in the chat or put your hand up. And more than anything, uh, switch on your video. This is a very informal uh, discussion session and its technology is already alienating. So if you're happy to switch your video on, we'd really encourage you so that we can have um, some nice discussions. Um, I'd like to just hand over to my colleague Nando for um, uh, an introduction from himself, and then we will um, get on with um, the presentation, please, Nando. Thank you, Rana, and hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to, to do this uh, initiative together with the, the, the MENA Social Policy Network. Uh, Iris has been working on issues related to migrant workers and uh, and the connection between immigration systems and forms of work exploitation. At the moment, uh, we are running a European Horizon project on issues of irregularization of migration and work. Uh, so we were very keen to also to to start this conversation and particularly working also and uh, the importance of the work that ILO has been doing on the area of social protection of migrant workers is particularly important to us. So it's great to be here and to join. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Nando. So I shall just introduce our speakers. I'm sure they need no introduction as well. They're leading lights um, in this area in the region. Um, so as we've said, they're presenting their report on the state of social protection for migrant workers in the GCC countries. Uh, they are Dr. Luca Pellerano, who is a senior social protection specialist for the ILO in the Arab states region. He has provided technical assistance on the design, implementation, and evaluation of contributory and non-contributory social protection systems and programs in the Arab region, Sub-Saharan Africa, Eastern Europe, and Central Asia. Prior to joining the ILO, uh, Luca led the poverty and social protection team at Oxford Policy Management and uh, in the UK and served as a senior, as a research economist at the Institute of Fiscal Studies, also in London. Um, also very pleased to introduce Dr. Leah Bukhater, who is a social protection technical officer at the ILO Regional Office for the Arab States since 2021. She is a former lecturer in development studies at the American University um, the, of Beirut in Lebanon, and she earned her PhD in development studies from the School of Oriental and African Studies um, at the University of London. Her research focuses on labor relations and social security. Currently, she is exploring the legal and effective social protection of migrant workers in the Gulf region and is the author of The Labor Movement in Lebanon, Power on Hold, published by MUP. Is that Manchester University Press? 2022. That's great. Fantastic. Welcome, everyone. Um, over to you, please, uh, Luca and Leah. Thank you. Are you happy to share your slides? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Rana and colleagues for having us uh, in your webinar. So I'll share quickly my screen. Um, the presentation, correct. Okay, thank you. Um, 
I'm very happy to be uh, with you today to have this discussion together on the findings that uh, we have been uh, working on for the past three years here at the ILO. Uh, first things first, so uh, as you know, social protection is a set of policies and programs that help people um, um, whenever they um, experience one of the nine risks um, and to prevent uh, poverty and vulnerability throughout their lives. And these nine risks, as per uh, the definition of social protection, would include, for instance, maternity, unemployment, old age, sickness, disability, etc. According to the latest World Social Protection Report, less than half of the global population does not have any um, um, access uh, to social protection, or if you want to say it uh, better, only 47% are effectively covered for at least one of, uh, of the risks. If we look at, um, at the Arab region, we could see that uh, only 40% are effectively covered. Um, if we look at the GCC, uh, 61 of the population is protected uh, with some form of, of social protection. But typically, uh, one of the most um, globally, the most vulnerable populations who suffer from the lack of social protection are migrant workers. But if we look at the share of migrant workers in the workforce globally, you can see that they constitute around 5%. And this is the latest available results from 2019. Um, if we look at the Arab states, uh, and this is where we have circled it, uh, migrant workers in 2019 constitute 41% of the total workforce, and this is the highest uh, percentage in the in the world uh, if we compare the regions. And this is why it is important if you want to understand the social protection of migrant workers to delve into understanding the situation of migrant workers in the Arab region. And within the Arab region, GCC, as we all know, has the highest share of migrant workers, or we can even say three quarter of migrant workers in the Arab region are in the GCC. So it is in this context and right after COVID, which has amplified and magnified, um, you know, the importance of social protection, uh, that the ILO has renewed its effort on this issue and um, started since 2021 to uh, collect at least or start collecting empirical evidence um, on this topic. Um, in 2021, when we started, we had, you know, uh, some great literature with, uh, if you want to say, very um, um, uh, ambiguous statements. So we decided that this is where uh, the importance of this work to start collecting empirical evidence and also in a public policy framework, um, looking at the multiple streams, uh, framing the problem, uh, uh, also proposing solutions to the problem and looking at the political uh, background um, also at the time, um, we have we have um, tried to uh, frame the problem by collecting information, proposing solutions, and also keeping an eye on the political economy in the region. So today what we try to do is to give you just a quick snapshot of some of the data we have collected, um, which helps us begin to understand uh, the social protection of migrant workers in the region. Um, so as we start, our analytical framework, as the ILO, of course, uh, are uh, our conventions, our minimum standards. Um, and this is where this is our compass that have guided our research, our solutions, and our engagements. Um, uh, you probably know the conventions and the, the, the if you want the flagship uh, convention when it comes to social security. Is Convention 102, but you can see also on the screen other conventions that are also uh, a guiding uh, instrument, uh, in addition to also the flagship recommendation 202. You can see on the left of the screen kind of a temple uh, where we have principles that stem uh, from this convention that also guide our assessment, our research, and our engagement. So, um, just quickly, so when we talk about universality and our work, we, we the question is, uh, is everyone covered by the schemes we are looking to? Everyone, uh, every individual in the country we are, um, you know, uh, assessing uh, at the schemes in these countries. Is it, are they comprehensive? Are these schemes covering the nine risks 
as per the definition of social protection? Are the benefits adequate? Are they being paid in a predictable way? Are they adjusted periodically? And we also look at the sustainability of these schemes. To what extent uh, they are they taken into account the solidarity of financing? Um, are they transparent, the responsibility of the state, et cetera? It is, it is these principles, in addition, of course, the equality of treatment, uh, to the maintenance of, uh, of acquired rights and rights of uh, enforced acquisition, if you want to simplify it, to what extent uh, can these benefits be portable and exportable, and of course, the reciprocity. So, um, including also, of course, other principles, but it is these kinds of principles that stem from the conventions that guided our research. So this is, if you want, um, um, the, the, five, the five main uh, research outputs that we have produced. Um, I've tried the QR code. If you get your, your phone close to the QR code, you can scan it. And you get to our page where you can find all the reports. Uh, some of them are also available in Arabic. Um, so in our research, we have used uh, mixed methods. Uh, quantitative and qualitative in a cross-sequential way. So we moved between quantitative and qualitative as was needed and as was possible in the resources that we had. Um, this is just an example, but I just go quickly through it. So as I said, we use our principles to understand and assess what are the schemes available in the region for migrant workers. And I, I will show uh, in the next slide, for instance, if we look at employer liability schemes, which is the major type you know, of social protection, if we can say, in the region, if you look at the principles, they are not, they don't, they don't satisfy the equality of treatment, nor solidarity of uh, financing, nor uh, enforceability of rights and accountability. And also the, the responsibility of the state is almost, um, or let's say is very scant. Um, so this is our, if you want, uh, our compass. So what we first did, uh, of course, we start. We looked at the legal, um, the legal, the legal entitlements of migrant workers um, um, in, in social protection. We looked at the private sector, and this is a legal review that is, I think, the first of its kind. Um, and we we were updating it as we work, and we could see that a lot of reforms were happening. Um, and this uh, this infographic here uh, kind of flattens, if you want, the. The, the findings in a way, and, and the, the type of financing is color coded. You can see the light blue is for employer liability, and under the the non uh, the non national private sector employees quadrant, you can see that this is the only present type of social protection. The red ones are where you can see the when you can see the invasion of mandatory private insurance when it comes to healthcare. But we can also see, and this is something that Luca will tell us more about. How on man, this column that is um, the second uh, shade of blue, uh, is moving towards social insurance, the inclusion of migrant workers in social insurance uh, at par with nationals. And this is um, um, really uh, groundbreaking reforms that happened in support, with the support of the ILO that Luca will tell you more about in a bit. Um, we also looked at. Um, you know, the, the, to try to see the region beyond the GCC, what are the schemes and to what extent there is a possibility of, you know, good practices that can be also, uh, that could migrate to other parts of the region. And you could see here quickly how Northern Africa uh, is a progressive sub-region compared to the Levant or the Gulf, where migrant workers tend to be included at par with, um, with nationals. And also we can refer to our publication for more information on that. Um, we also tried here to conceptualize the barriers to social protection. And clearly what research shows us is that uh, when you have the URI, uh social protection, it doesn't really reflect effectively. There's a difference between um, you know, the URI and the facto social protection or access to social protection. And we try to conceptualize the types of barriers um, um, to, to understand you know, the difference between the gap between uh, the factor and the UR. You can see that our legal barriers, that there are also effective ones. So besides the fact that business workers can be excluded because they work in a certain sector, like domestic, uh, domestic work, or the nature of employment, let's say if they work in the gig economy, or by nationality, there are in a, another layer that also comes on top of it, 
uh, which are which are problems of enforcement and compliance, lack of awareness, that are also barriers. There are also barriers to adequate uh, social protection, um, such as, for instance, the lack of social protection coordination between these, the countries of origin and destination that does not allow for portability and exportability. And what we also tried to, on that topic, to reflect on, kind of also, you know, to try to have a vision, if you want, to, for the next maybe decade, uh, we tried to look specifically on the portability, let's say, of end of service indemnities um, in the in the frame uh, for in the context of end of service indemnities reforms in the region. Also, something that uh, Luca will tell you more about. Um, but we tried also to envision what would it be if we create a clearing house, or is the clearing house is created in the Gulf region where benefits can become easily uh, portable or exportable. And this is just to, you know, um, try to attempt to visualize um, this, this reflection. But um, we also, I mean, in this context, we looked at uh, what are the best ways uh, in line with international standards uh, to understand end of service indemnities and advance, of, uh, advance our understanding of possible solutions. Um, I hope I have just, I need just one more minute to say that as we looked at legal um, types of social protection, um, we had also to, to try with the extent, to the extent possible with the time that we have and the resources to look at effective social protection. To what extent uh, do migrant workers have access to effective social protection? And this is where um, what this report, which we can call our flagship report, um, uh, is important. So we tried to look at the six countries of the GCC with interviews, qualitative interviews, and uh, to try to see to what extent migrant workers have access to effective social protection. Um, we tried to show what are, to, to identify at least, what are the drivers and enablers of social protection of migrant workers with the, the qualitative information that we have. And we could see uh, quickly here that the enablers um, include, uh, which is interesting also for future policy work, um, emerging channels for migrant workers representation and advocacy are key to advance the effective access to social protection. International attention and commitments of countries to SDGs um, or even to, to other international instruments or even to national visions that they have in their countries was the driver, we could see it, the COVID-19, was uh, a driver to a certain extent, to a certain uh, period, which is right after the COVID. Barriers um, were the design of the migration system itself, the sponsorship system, is intrinsically linked to uh, the employer liability scheme, which is a very, as we can see, as, as a type of protection that is not aligned to any of the principles of uh, social security that we mentioned. The political economy of the, of, of the region is also a barrier that we need to look into. And of course, the limited representation and bargaining power, whether for nationals or non-nationals, is also, of course, a, an obstacle to the advancement of effective access. Um, there is, of course, more, but we don't have time to, to delve into it, but we invite you to look at our research. Um, you know, and so, so if you want to, you know, look at one of the most central barriers, it's definitely the, the migration system in the, in the GCC. As this migration system today is unfolding or changing, um, this, is, this has implications and reflections also on the social protection system that we uh, that also we will talk about in a bit. So Kafala in itself is of course a main structural factor that limits the access to social protection and reinforces, as I just said, this employer provided benefit that is difficult to enforce, difficult to monitor, um, and has become a, a burden uh, for uh, uh, you know state institutions to to, uh, to 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 enforce or to even address the grievances and the complaints that come from uh, from the system. Now, here at that point, what we had um, we did not have enough information to understand effective social protection. And um, we took into account the research ethics, of course, which dictated to protect workers as we interview them on, on, on this issue. And this is why uh, we, we also uh, ventured, if you want, to do additional quantitative research 
with workers and employers. And here I leave uh, the floor to Luca to tell us more about this. Thank you. Thank you, Leah, and it's a pleasure to join uh, um, indeed this um, uh, conversation with you all today. Um, maybe just one point still on the previous slide, Leah, to sort of highlight uh, that very much th that migration system in the GCC that is built on the notion of a short-term migration um, and uh, very much uh, migration in the, in the form of of a commodity, if you want, for uh, uh, a specific production system that uh, GCC countries, um, you know, run run on, uh, reinforces, you know, this notion of social protection as something which has to do exclusively with the employer-employee relationship, as opposed to a matter of public concern, if if you want, and and further re reinforces the notion of social protection as something which should be provided by the employer. Uh, on a short-term basis, as opposed to involving uh, state institutions uh, in the in delivery of and uh, of of those rights, uh, but certainly you will have heard about ongoing reforms of the kafala system, partial, not fully complete, but the complete the ongoing rethinking of the nature of migration in the GCC um, opens new space uh, to rethink also the role of social protection in that context. On the one hand, to cover new risks, um, such as uh, unemployment, uh, where as countries try to facilitate labor mobility and the transition of workers, migrant workers from one employer to another, uh, but also the emergence of new forms of employment. Leah mentioned the gig, increasing share of gig economy, also the increasing role of self-employment or self, what's called flexi, flexible visas in the GCC labor markets. And finally, the need to establish more system which are more based on solidarity across uh, different sectors, across employers, which is typically what happened in the developed world as countries transition from employer sponsored benefits to national systems um, uh, to full um, social insurance based uh, approaches. So what's the landscape in the next slide with um, effective access? Leah gave us a picture of the progress vis-a-vis -vis the legal coverage and showed us some of the gaps in terms of the rights that migrant workers can enjoy. But let's see how those tra translate in terms of effective ability of workers to access some of those essential elements of a decent work agenda, which has to come with uh, protection at different levels. Here we have uh, uh, interviewed uh, returnees uh, uh, from one of the most important sending countries to the GCC, Nepal. On the way back from the six GCC countries, we interviewed them at the airport in Kathmandu and asked them a few questions about their experience with the social protection system in the GCC. And we found a picture which is summarized in this slide and tells us about significant gaps. All the numbers you see here are are workers who do not access social protection in its different shapes and forms. While the picture is perhaps a little bit more encouraging for health, countries in the GCC have established mandatory health insurance schemes with different uh, characteristics. So only one in four workers do not access health insurance. We see uh, much uh, wider gaps for other types of benefits. Um, for example, paid sick leave, uh, a bit less than 80% couldn't access paid sick, sick leave. Um, employment injury protection, an issue which was very much at the forefront of the debate during the FIFA World Cup in Qatar, 40% uh, had to pay the cost of treatment in the case of an injury. Also, end of service, which is the only benefit available to workers as they leave the GCC. They don't uh, participate in any pension system like we're used to know in the a developed world and like um, national workers enjoy, but um, um, very much um, what we find is four in 10, four out of 10 workers have returned home without their rights to end of service being paid. And also because all of these, all of these benefits are expected to be delivered and provided by, by employer, the only way to claim them is to go through a process of labor dispute or, or eventually to go to court. So we see that only 7% of workers who did not um, uh, feel they were um, given access to benefits they were entitled to actually took the efforts at uh, making a complaint um, 
um, um, when sick and, and only 17 made a complaint in case of unpaid end of service. So really how the power asymmetry, which is built in this migration, short-term migration system we've been talking about and the kafala system more broadly also affects workers' ability to claim uh, benefits when when they, even those, if you want limited benefits that they're entitled to by, by law. A second uh, element that this slide shows is also the great uh, um, uh, disparity in access uh, by sector and by income and, and gender. So we perhaps don't have time to go into the details, but you can see how higher income workers tend to be much better covered. So it's really the lower income uh, workers that face a much significant, uh, much, much, much bigger gap in accessing their social protection rights. And also that women are significantly at disadvantage when it comes to exercising access to those benefits, which is also matched if you look at the quadrant at the bottom left by also access um, by sector um, domestic work, um, as well as the um, uh, sort of being a sector where um, worker protection in general is weaker, workers rights is weaker, workers voice is weaker, and therefore that also translates into um, much lower rate of access to these benefits, which sometimes are not even defined by law, even in the form of employers' uh, sponsors' benefits. So what to do from here? How can this conversation be taken forward? What is the space to bridge this gap? In the next slide, we have asked employers what they think about the current approach to financing and managing social protection. This is data from Kuwait. And we find that contrary to perhaps what uh, our expectations were, there is much more of a varied range of perceptions amongst employers as to the, uh, satis their satisfaction with the current social protection arrangements. We see particularly how small and medium-sized enterprises tend to uh, appreciate uh, or are less appreciative of the way in which social protection arrangements are currently set. Uh, which, if you remember um, what Leah mentioned, uh, con constitutes a significant burden on workers uh, as they have to directly finance all benefits. Imagine a short, a small, um, a small employer who, in the space of a few months, may face an accident or the workplace, or um, may see few workers leaving the country and therefore owe owing um, large amounts in end of service to those workers, this can represent a very significant burden on small enterprises because there's no mechanism of solidarity in the financing. And definitely during COVID, uh, there has been a major realization of the weaknesses and limitations of these systems where, with many workers returning home unpaid, particularly from work from uh, uh, firms of small and medium size. So certainly uh, the financial risk of out of pocket pocket cost and the high responsibility on employers is a point on which countries um, are, um, have, have started reacting and, and we have started seeing some reform in this regard. In the next slide, uh, uh, we, we see also some perspectives from the workers themselves. So we also ask workers about their willingness to contribute to more uh, directly support uh, participation in social protection. And we see that while there is about a third with a bit of difference depending on the type of benefit who are in principle willing to participate in social protection, um, the amount that um, uh, migrant workers are actually ready to allocate to potential contributions to social protection is quite limited and really gets only a bit more significant around $10 monthly. Uh, for workers in the public sector, we tend to be white uh, collar workers at higher levels of uh, education and wages. And in the next slide, we see that what drives perhaps this uh, limited um, uh, uh, willingness to contribute by workers is a mix of uh, uh, lack of trust, sense of fairness in the sense that there is a perception that it should be a responsibility of employers or host countries as opposed to workers themselves to contribute to social protection. But also very importantly, you see in the bottom half of the graph, the vast majority of migrant workers 
do prioritize remittances over any other form of um, of, of savings or or or, or long term planning. So really, we know how much remittances do constitute de facto the only form of social protection that migrant workers rely on in terms of their future plans and also their immediate needs to support families uh, back home. So this relationship between social protection and remittance is certainly one that needs to be looked, uh, looked at uh, deeper as we engage further with this research. Finally, in the last slide, we also ask uh, workers, what about their preferences uh, for the kind of social protection that would be uh, perhaps be more encouraged to participate into. You see in terms of who should finance uh, this mix of uh, responsibilities given to countries of origin, so their own uh, uh, government of Nepal having to play perhaps a bigger role in, in extending um, uh, means to, uh, to protect workers uh, overseas and their families back home. Also, uh, the government of countries of destinations I mentioned and employers as a key uh, responsible actor in the financing of a more comprehensive package of support. And also that in terms of who should manage these workers, we see a relatively low level of trust in any solution that involves private insurance and perhaps um, again, more trust in, in sending countries, government of sending countries in this case, Nepal as having to play a role. So this is a bit the picture in terms of what employers feel, what workers feel, and uh, what is the result in terms of the actual gaps in coverage. So I will close now with a couple more minutes just to highlight what have been entry points to the extension agenda, which we have seen quite importantly over the past few years of engaging on this topic with a number of countries having announced important reforms in this field. And the first uh, message here is that there have really been multiple entry points for this agenda. Uh, when we take the ascending countries perspective, I mentioned already Kafala, the need to increase labor mobility and therefore to broaden the nature of protection uh, as workers more easily transition from one work, uh, in, uh, job to another. Also the agenda of leveling the playing field in the GCC labor markets, as many countries are pursuing this agenda of nationalization of the workforce, it's really a bit problematic to have this kind of very segmented labor market with much cheaper, cheaper labor, both on the wage, but also in terms of social protection costs, which de facto, de facto undercuts the efforts of countries to try and bring a larger share of their national populations in the labor market. A third agenda has really been the attraction of and retention of skilled labor as countries try to move to more value added productivity based uh, uh, models uh, really training and attracting skilled labor is a key dimension and social protection can be a, an important element of attraction to particularly white collar workers. Finally, uh, savings uh, uh, through uh, social protection for migrant workers can be aligned with national investment strategies. And also I mentioned the heavy burden on labor dispute. Imagine um, with so many cases of unpaid rights to migrant workers, the volume of cases that go to labor court and labor administration, labor dispute is very high, and ministries of labor are really struggling with the capacity to process those claims um, uh, and those and those uh, um, uh, high level of lit litigation. So a wide range of objective, including perhaps eventually the idea that having migrant workers more actively participate in the national systems can also help uh, make those national systems more viable in the long term, like it's happening in some of the countries in, in Europe. So with these uh, different entry points, we have seen a significant acceleration of reforms here. We just give to you some nuggets of reforms that have been announced just in the last couple of years. I'll speak a bit more about Oman, but in the Emirates, new announced end of service scheme and unemployment insurance scheme that covers both national and non-national workers. Also Bahrain for the first time introduces a social insurance uh, end of service model for, for um, uh, migrant workers. So it's really been um, since COVID um, a, a big acceleration of the realization perhaps of GCC countries that they cannot operate under the previously um, fully employer sponsor systems to system which involve either more of the state institutions like the case of Oman and Bahrain or the private sector. 
like the case of the UAE, and not all of these models align fully with the international standards. So some important points for discussion there. In the next slide, um, I think we can skip it. Uh, it's it's on the change of the nature of end of service from a employer uh, sponsor scheme to a national fund to a provident fund, like it has been the case for Bahrain and for the uh, for Oman. And uh, one element which is also seeing lots of attention is the um, uh, introduction of new uh, systems for health insurance. Uh, typically, migrant workers were um, accessing public health systems um, financed through general budget as national workers. We've seen over the past, I would say, five to 10 years, an important shift towards private health uh, insurance schemes for migrant workers also with the idea of segmenting, perhaps reducing the burden on public health systems from migrants and diverting migrants' health care towards private uh, hospital also as a way to foster both the private health insurance and the private health care uh, business opportunities in the GCC. But it's interesting to see how several countries have put those efforts on hold in Bahrain, in Kuwait, and in Oman, these reforms to private insurance system for health for migrant workers have been designed, but put on hold. So something quite interesting to, to follow up there. The country which has by far been more ambitious in these reforms has been Oman. Um, I don't think we have perhaps much time to delve into the details of the Oman reform, but Oman adopted last year a major reform which has completely reconfigured their social protection system merging 11 pension funds into one and establishing one single national social protection institution called the Social Protection Fund, which caters for both nationals and non-nationals. For the first time, including non-nationals under a range of new benefits, which didn't exist before, a cash sickness benefit, a paid maternity and uh, paternity leave benefit, an unemployment insurance benefit, as well as an end of service fund um, uh, to administer end-of-service benefits. The driver of the reforms in Oman has not been, uh, of course, the inclusion of non-Omanis. It has been much more addressing the pension uh, uh, long-term liabilities and fiscal impact of the pension system, as well as establishing uh, perhaps a new social contract in the time of cuts of energy subsidies and other tax reforms and in general to facilitate labor market mobility for nationals from public to private sector. But the inclusion of migrant workers was very much uh, a significant, if you want, byproduct of this reform. And one that now other countries should see with lots of interest because Oman is setting perhaps a new benchmark in the region from the perspective of full inclusion of migrant workers in their national systems. Um, I think I'll skip this to say there is still a bit of work to do in Oman. Uh, this is our sl last slide to give you um, maybe a, a sense of what are the research questions or the policy questions as, as a team that will continue to engage on this topic. We would like to continue to engage perhaps uh, in closer collaboration with some of you and other researchers in the coming years. One is of course, whether out of this new a uh, wave of reforms in the region, we would see more convergence and di divergence in the approaches that different countries are taking. As I mentioned, some going more towards privatization of social insurance, other more so are involved in public administration and gradual alignment of the systems for nationals and non-nationals. Uh, will there be a move toward more inclusive approaches or more segmented approaches, which seems to be the case in some countries where there is a tendency of actually uh, further uh, separating the entitlement between nationals and non-national workers. How will eventually these reforms translate from policy change to effective access to social protection? Um, and um, how will the impact be different uh, across different cohorts of the migrant population, particularly uh, white uh, collar versus blue collar workers? Um, a key question for us is, the role of sending countries in this debate, which so far have been perhaps a bit more timid in placing social protection as a topic for a debate in their um, a dialogue with GCC countries on labor migration management. So how big will social protection become as part of the MOUs and uh, bila other bilateral negotiations that are taking place um, between Asian countries, but more importantly, 
by African countries, which um, uh, knowing that Afri African sending countries are taking an increasing share of the uh, working uh, migrant workers population in, in the GCC. Finally, will there be any space to move towards uh, a stronger consolidation of agreements between sending countries and countries of destination, social security agreement, or other types of portability of benefits, which is the horizon of ILO standards, knowing that only if social protection becomes portable, meaning becomes something that workers can enjoy as they return home and their families, perhaps that could also influence the current preference to, uh, let's say, um, prioritize re remittances over any other type of protection. I think I'll stop here. We took a bit longer than we expected, but we hope this was uh, gives you a, a good uh, take on on what our research um, and policy work has so far entailed. And we very much look forward to your uh, feedback, inputs, questions, uh, as we do have an interest to work more actively with research partners in upcoming stages of our engagement on the topic. Back to you, Rana. Thank you so much, uh, Luca and Leia. That's very um, insightful and, and lots of food for thought there. Um, so over to our colleagues uh, on the webinar, questions, feedback in the chat, or please put your hand up. Um, thank you so much. And I would just want to emphasize, so Nando prepares himself. I'd, I'd like to please also make space perhaps at the end uh, for Nando's comments as well, please. So we'll try and make sure we've got time for that before we end at two. Um, yes, please. Uh, is it Fouke? Uh, Yang, hello. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay, hello. <laughs> nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Um, uh, nice to meet you, everyone. My name is Yang, and I am from Birmingham Business School and Assistant Professor in Organization, Work and Employment. So, um, I don't research on Arab regions, but I did, uh, but I've done some research on uh, social protection uh, for Chinese migrant workers. I mean, internal migrant labor. So, I see quite a bit of parallel here. Yeah. So we just what so so um so yeah, there are quite a lot of countries. Countries uh, uh, in the GC, uh, I mean, quite a lot of um, uh, independent political entities within the GCC. So we're just wondering, um, like probably Oman is quite exceptional. Yeah. So we're just wondering, first of all, in other countries where uh, migrant workers are not necessarily covered now, do you mean that they there are no institutions covering them, or is it just that it, it is it more like the institution is there they are eligible on paper, but then there are so many different there are so many different barriers uh, relating to who they are and also their uh, working circumstances, uh, which deter them from um, participating or demotivized uh, the incentivize them to participate, and uh, the second question is about um, what the like if workers are to uh, get social protection or get social insurance, um, what is the process of um, what is the process of registering regist registering? Like for example, in Oman, where it, the cases uh, where the ex uh, experience is more successful, are workers opted in or uh, are they? Also, uh, I mean, do workers have to opt in by themselves, or do workers or employers have to opt in by themselves, or is it like an automatic process when the um when the employment relationship starts? Yeah, and um, so if they do get insured, um, um, if they do if they do get insured and if they do get protected, um, are their entitlements like how is that? How are their entitlements? compared, I mean, the level of entitlements compared with like um, non-migrant workers in those countries. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Luca Leia, would you like to collect some questions, a few questions first, or do you want to just respond? You collect a few questions. Okay, thank you so much, Ying. So you've got two questions there. Would anybody else like to comment, please, or ask a question? Okay, well, I just wanted to quickly step in, if I may put in a question, just to clarify the question of financing, uh, please, uh, Luca and Leia. Um, I mean, there were various examples uh, in your slides, and, and it's clear that the pressure on employers is there, particularly for the smaller ones, and in the absence of properly functioning taxation systems, though I did see some reference to tax reform in the Oman case, I would just appreciate just if you could give us more information about the, ne the next steps in terms of the financing and different models, perhaps that, that uh, you might like to explore as an organization or that the countries 
are exploring uh, for the financing of, of these systems for migrant workers. So thank you. Hopefully you've got good questions there that can warm up other colleagues. But for now, over to you, Luca and Leah. I can take the first question and then we can take the last question. Um, so we thank you for your uh, questions. Um, maybe because we went a bit uh, too quickly on 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 the types um, of assistance protection that are available. So on paper, um, most of the time, the social protection available is an employer liability scheme, which means that they are protected not via an institution, as you asked, not via the social insurance scheme, but it's the the responsibility of the employer. For instance, if there's an employment injury to uh, pay uh, a compensation, or let's say at the end of the employment relationship, the employer on, on his own is responsible to pay the end of service uh, indemnity. In case of, let's say, uh, sickness, most of the time, it is the employer who has to you know, uh, provide this, uh, this sick leave that is compensated, not through a social insurance institution. Um, so you asked also on, on our man, on, on the reforms, um, so, I mean, uh, to go back to the first question, of course, countries differ and contingencies uh, also differ in, in, into how much they are protected or not. Um, but mostly, uh, it's an employer liability. Um, and for instance, if we if you want to talk about healthcare, when we say it's now mandatory, but it's pending, it's the employer has to pay for an insurance scheme, for a private insurance. Uh, for uh, for our man, so um, these reforms imply that it's the employer who has to pay a contribution to the new social protection fund, and it is mandatory in the case of the four contingencies that was that were mentioned, which is uh, sickness, maternity, employment injury, um, and we can also there's like the problems fund that replaces end of service event. So this is in short. Thank you. Uh, maybe maybe to add, I mean, the the I think the the first one of the questions was also about you know the diversity amongst GCC, and indeed I think I think these are in a way homogeneous because across all GCCs, migrant workers do represent an important share of the total working population, but also there are quite some important differences. I mean, if you look at Oman, for example. Uh, it's about it's together with Saudi Arabia is the country where no no money where nationals are take a let's say larger share of the total working population I think it's about a quarter are national and 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 um, and uh, three quarters are non-nationals compared to the case of Qatar where for example only five percent of workers are nationals and so that that's sort of really uh, uh, places this debate uh, uh, quite differently to the dynamics of, of domestic labor markets and the agendas of inclusion of the domestic national workers in labor markets is clearly quite quite important in countries such as Oman or or Saudi Arabia to some extent also Bahrain um, and indeed the entitlements of, of, of national workers tend to be quite different to the ones of migrant workers so uh, the country, the region is known, for example, for very, very generous pensions, pension schemes for for national workers. Not only generous in terms of high benefits, but also very short minimum contributory periods. So, uh, workers in the GCC, uh, national workers in the GCC, are able to retire after a very short period of time. So, early retirement, uh, especially from the public sector, is a very typical phenomenon, which also by the way, it depresses or or reduces uh, attractiveness of private sector jobs because many workers are basically waiting for their job in the public sector so that they can get a, a good package and retire relatively early. And and the reforms we have seen, for example, definitely the Oman reforms have been very much driven by that objective of reducing also that gap between public and private sector jobs in their domestic labor markets to to attract. A larger share of national workers to private sector job, which can be more productive. In doing so, rethinking the type of benefits that can also be leveled across the public and private sector workers, as well as with migrant workers. Now, when it comes to um, um, 
you know, so when it comes to pensions, it's really a, a very segmented system. Migrant workers don't have any right to pension. They only get end of service, which is quite limited. Is in the best of cases, one month per year served. Um, and so you would you have seen, for example, how in the UAE, some of these schemes that have been recently introduced have been driven by the will to attract um, high skilled workers by offering private pensions on top of the end of service. In the financial district, in the public sector, migrant workers play a very important role to actually for some some sectors to function. They very much require on the skills of you know, foreign workers. And so attracting foreign workers and retaining foreign workers with a better social protection package, better pension, better health protection has been very much an agenda, which has driven some of the reforms that we have seen. Certainly in the UAE, it has been the primary uh, driver of, uh, of reforms that have taken place in the, in the past few years. Now, in terms of financing, to go to the question of Rana, I mean, uh, all of these reforms, uh, are primarily driven on uh, uh, employer financing. So there hasn't been much of a shift to other sources of financing. It's basically changing the nature of that financing as opposed to being like a direct obligation that I take with my worker as an employer. I pay into a fund and then that fund manages the risks uh, collectively, which is already a good step in terms of in, in establishing some form of state or public institution responsibility in the in the management of, of that risk. Huh? So basically the shift has been from an individual employer financing to a collective risk pooling across employers. That has been the case of all these reforms in Oman and also the establishment of these mandatory health insurance schemes, more recently also unemployment in the UAE. Mm. Uh, some Some of the conversation has also gone towards the willingness of migrant workers to contribute themselves. So how would and how much would migrant workers be willing to put aside part of their own savings where they have to participate into these schemes? And that's where, I mean, really the trade-off between that uh, space of financing and remittances, I think is the key is the key issue and goes with the matter of trust, trust in institutions in the GCC, trust in institutions back home and goes to the issue of portability, the extent to which these benefits can somehow give right to uh, entitlements that can be uh, uh, enjoyed uh, back home and by the families also uh, back home. But the taxation uh, conversation is very much, um, let's say, uh, dynamic in the region. There, there, are, there have been uh, timid efforts toward introducing private uh, personal income tax in some countries also VAT, I mean, re let's remember these are countries which have no form of traditional taxation, all the, most of the revenue is through oil revenue. So uh, certainly the reform in Oman is driven also by this gradual introduction of taxation, indirect taxation VAT, and the willingness to, if you want, compensate national uh, constituents, constituencies with a, a, a new package of social benefits that go with that uh, you know, demand to also participate in financing uh, by households and um, and 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 workers. Mm. Thank you so much. Very interesting, and I'm sure uh, more could be said. I was just thinking with parallels. With it may not be the best parallel, but with the uh, social security corporation in Jordan and uh, and what's happening there with the collection of sub. I mean, they call them subscription fees as well. So it's. Interesting, but thank you very much for sharing this. Um, would anybody like uh, anybody else like to ask questions or provide feedback, please? Okay, so please. Rana, please. sorry, can oh, I just add one yes. one small point because I yes. think um, Ying made a made a question about the registration process. So these registration processes are, are rather. Um, automatic in the sense that they are very much linked with visa status and and work permits so there is a automatic link uh this the requirement for private insurance or other types of insurances are kind of wired into the broader labor migration systems um countries are also increasingly introduce new wage protection systems and other systems which are all linked um However, there is a new emerging form of employment in the GCC, which is self-employment. I mean, this didn't exist pretty much um, up until recently. Now, with some of the reforms, uh, more flexible visa statuses are emerging. 
and uh, where there are still kafils or sponsors, but these are more like fictional sponsors in some cases and workers themselves have much more of an active role in engaging with their labor rights. And that opens new sets of questions. I mean, how, for example, to extend these new forms of protection to what could be uh, called as an equivalent of self-employed in, um, in, in, um, you know, in, in, in Western economies. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, not wishing to uh, interrupt, but I think just mindful of the time uh, as well. Please may we uh, hand over to Nando with your comments and concluding thoughts. Thank you, Nando. Sorry, uh, no, what I said is I had more a question than, than uh, final comment, but it's fine. Uh, so I was thinking around the variation, understanding the variation between the countries and to what extent uh, we see different actors within each country playing a role in shaping this protection system. I was wondering to understand you have the same actor place. I'm thinking about the work we are doing here in Europe. You can see the role of foreign uh, office is growing compared to the home, home affair in some countries. So I was wondering who is running the, the, the agenda around this. Uh, the, the second point was about the competition between countries and the region in terms of, uh, because in the sense you were almost presenting them as uh, you know, within the national silo rather than and giving us what they are doing each nationally. But I was wondering to understand that there are trends that move between them as a result of attempt to um, attract and retain specific kinds of groups of migrant workers. And the final one was a point you made at the end around the role of sending countries. And I was wondering to understand you are seeing different sending countries because of the difference in terms of the profile of the migrant workers in the, in the region playing different kind of role. Uh, uh, if you have already started to detect some some of, around these sort of different roles that the, the sending country can play. So that was the points. Uh, I don't know if you got time for points, but it was yeah. a pleasure. So we, we, we have a minute. Uh, yes, so if we may. We can try, um, we can try. So quickly, I think on yeah. the, on the who is running the agenda, that's a very interesting question. And it, there is indeed quite some difference. In some countries, the agenda is run primarily by social security institutions who uh, have uh, some of their financial sustainability issues they may want to address by having a broader range of workers participate in, this, in the systems. Uh, in some countries, these are driven more by ministries of finance who want to create uh, new opportunities for investment, uh, maybe for private sector development um, for banks and private insurers to, 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 to develop. Um, and I, I think in some countries it's more linked to more of a labor reforms agenda. So ministries of labor are more engaged. And typically also it's quite a fragmented landscape where not always ministry of health and labor and, and the different players sort of uh, work on a coherent uh, 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 agenda. So um, in, in few countries, I would say there is a, a healthy social dialogue environment. So workers and employers organizations are relatively more on the receiving end as opposed to on the driving seat of these, of these reforms uh, from what we've seen. Uh, definitely there is competition across countries on this agenda. And the fact that there have been some trendsetters have also spurred um, some uh, sort of um, skin interest uh, of countries are looking at what each other is doing and trying to position themselves as the most innovative or most ambitious country with this reform. It has been interesting to, to witness. And certainly also with sending countries, the, the, we, haven't, we haven't, I don't think positions have become very explicit yet as to how they want to relate with these new developments in the, re developments in the region. But certainly we can expect that countries which have a higher share of high skilled workers or or white collar workers will be more sensitive to some of these topics, as opposed to others for whom the main concern is about the worst form of exploitation and wage protection, um, where maybe social protection can be seen as a as a as a further further down the line in terms of the agenda of, of what they want to to pursue, and also where the pressure for labor exporting may be may be predominant. So typically, for example, the Philippines has been a country which has very been kind of in the forefront of the social protection agenda. And now it's going to be interesting to see how other countries, particularly from Asia, may pick up on this, while probably African countries are a bit lagging behind and, and focusing on other elements of of, of of more basic labor protection concerns that they may have.
Okay, well, thank you so much, colleagues. We have run out of time, I'm afraid, and um, there will be other meetings to attend. So I'm sure there'll be more conversations. Feel free to connect with each other. And if you'd like to reach out to anyone, let us know. We'd be very happy to put you in touch. Um, thank you again, uh, Leah, Luca. Thank you very much, Nando, for your co-hosting and, and presence and support. Um, all the best, everyone. Uh, hopefully we will meet again. Um, and a recording of the webinar will circulate soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Olivia. And uh, thank you, Islam. He's there somewhere. Bye, everyone. Mm -hmm.